Welcome to Tea with Cecil. My name is Cecil Castellucci. Today's guest, my very first one, is Andrea Klein. Uh, Andrea Klein is the author of novels Calf, uh, described by Publishers Weekly as unsettling, scary, and often brilliant. I think always brilliant is probably a better way of putting it. And Eden, which was named one of the smartest, most innovative thrillers by Vanity Fair um, uh, and was a finalist for the Publishing Triangle Award. She's done those books, but she's a polymath. Um, she's also a performance artist, um, and uh, she has been commissioned by the Chocolate Factory and done things at New York Live Arts. She's a choreographer. She's been described as an enigmatic and eccentric because that's what she is. She also happens to be one of my besties in the whole world. There's garbage trucks coming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, She's also one of my besties in the whole world. Please meet Andrea Klein. Hi, Andrea. Hello. How are you today? I'm I'm doing all right. Okay, all good. Right. Yeah. Good. Um, uh, so uh, this is Tea with Cecil. This is my inaugural uh, thing. Um, and basically it's because just the idea of going back into my house for a few weeks was too much and Zoom cocktails, I'm over it. So I thought maybe I would like talk to some of my favorite art makers uh, during this time and share you with the world. So um, the first first thing is, uh, do you wanna add anything to your fabulous bio? How would you describe yourself? Well, you're the second friend who's called me a polymath in, mm -hmm. in, in recent years. So I think I'm gonna add that to my bio because people seem to be adding it already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm also I'm working on a new novel called The Gleaners and um, and I recently completed a film. I forget if you said that in my bio or not. It I did not. Know. It's hard to keep track of. But you don't have to get ahead of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the question. Right. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. All right. Um, so I'm going to ask you I 10 questions. Oh. When I was a when I was a a a, a young uh, dancer, I was known for jumping uh, ahead of cues. You know. Oh. So I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it. Perfect. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, keep you know, follow the path. Um, okay, so this is tea with Cecil. Basically, I'm going to ask um, the same ten questions to all the guests that I have who are like you, fabulous art makers. Um, so my first question is, uh, I've got my cup of something. Um, uh, I'm drinking some chamomile tea today in a homemade Star Wars The Force Awakens cup. Um, what are you drinking? What kind of tea are you drinking? Well, what I was, are you drinking? I, I went I went to we have a a tea tin and um this is kind of the tin of orphaned tea bags mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it it was um i had been drinking this green tea that was in here and then um and now it's gone i don't know what it was but um and so now we're on the dregs where there's only like medicinal crap like throat coat or something but anyway but i found this and i don't know what it is but i'm gonna drink it it says it's um Linnea Snella. Sounds like a good a, name for a character. Yeah, it's actually, the description is in um, Spanish, hmm. which I don't read, but I, I think I am discerning that it's a green tea from South America that you're supposed to drink at night. Natural remedy combat All right. something. All right, so I'm going to do it. It might be terrible. Okay, great. I terrible. love it. I was going to ask, is it your favorite? But I guess it that it's your it's your adventure. It's my adventure. Yeah. My adventure in orphan teas. I love it. I love, I have also a orphan tea. Um, uh, uh, I mean, who doesn't, right? That like, You just collect tea bags for some reason and um, and there they are. Um, okay, so my, my second question is, who are you, Andrea Klein? Uh, and basically, how do we know each other? Well, we know each other. I don't know who I am, but we know each other um, because we were both we undergrads at NYU um, some decades ago. And we lived in the same dorm on the same floor, on the same end of the same floor of the same dorm. 
and I believe the story goes that you befriended me because you thought I was going out with some guy who you had a crush on and so you were mad that I had a relationship with him which was completely untrue I had like no relationship with this person whatsoever um I think so it was our we RA. formed a relationship you and I a friendship I think it was our RA wasn't it our resident assistants I, I have no I have no idea or, yeah I can't remember um anyway that like what I all I remember I don't even remember that part I remember just like that end of the hallway at NYU Hayden Hall which I think is called something different now and we would just like sit like it was like like it was the beach <laughs> and then have beers we would yes at in the, the end of the hallway um and and yeah and so I was in one room and but then we did become roommates didn't we then our second year we were roommates yes the first year no we were we were I'm not yeah. sure about this tea um, I was always impressed with, um, you know, because you were doing experimental theater workshop at NYU, and that was very arty, and um, and uh, uh, you you just always were like quiet, quietly wise in our like 17, 18 year old world. You're just very quietly wise, and I really loved that about you because I was so wildly not wise. <laughs> I'm I'm doing it now, I guess. Oh yeah, you are <laughs> quietly wise. Um, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm just being quiet. Um so um, at, oh go ahead. No you so at, at, so what made you decide to this I always wondered what made you what drew you to um to ETW. I remember you talking a lot about like you know Gregowski's Prince and like, you know, and like all these things that you were learning. How do you think the stuff at NYU sort of like helped inform your work, your artworks today? Well, I think, um, God, um, I don't know when you go, it's sort of strange because when you go through a conservatory type program in performing arts, it's sort of like the people you go through, it's sort of this is a horrible comparison, but it's sort of like, it's like a deep bond with those people, um, your fellow classmates. I was gonna say it's like war buddies, but obviously I've never been in a war and it's like not fair for me really to make that assumption, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's like a deep um, connection, I think, because it, it's, it's, um, you're, made very vulnerable and I didn't study writing you know in college so but I presume when you lay your shit bare in a writing workshop it's very similar so um, I mean I never studied writing either <laughs> so I don't actually know <laughs> right. um so I think there's um those early studies in in performing arts attracted me to exploring vulnerability I think that's definitely a through line in my work in my in my books um, um, definitely uh, exploring vulnerability and a, a question that I always ask is what like what is authenticity what is authenticity like what is an authentic experience and when you're a writer um, similar to when you're like a theater director or a choreographer or, or a film director you okay I, I just uh, this is just a side note I don't know if you can hear this but I, I live with a musician who's doing something in the next room such as life um anyway when you're a director or an author or an author um you are you're like you're controlling the story and this is always, it's like a weird kind of conceptual ethics question that I'm sort of interested in is like, how much should you control it? And like, or like when we think about artworks that really move us and yet sometimes we feel emotionally manipulated by them, like, is that, 
an ethical thing to do like do you want to like this whole idea of like but i want you to feel a certain way but if i make you feel a certain way that's like i don't know traumatic you know is that a purposeful thing to do as an artist i just went like way off in some other direction you just asked no. like what it was and when we were 19 that was no, I, love what it. I was still doing i think um, it's sort of related because i think one of the things that um attracted me to you as a friend as a person as a person that i adore who i have as a vital nourishing <laughs> sister friend um is the way that you approach story and the way that you approach narratives that like, I don't think I was brave enough, even though I was like, you know, thinking differently than the mainstream. Remember we took that class, Art, Artists and Social Change. Remember that class? Oh yeah, it was really horrible. It was a terrible class. But, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, you know, really wanted to, I, I think you were way ahead of me in the curve of sort of thinking about narratives in a different way, like, just all the performance art pieces that you did and the way that you approached story, whether you were taking from your own life, whether you were taking from like a found piece that that you did. Like, I remember that piece that I loved where you were like walking on those teacups and, you know, just all these, um, all these ways that you sort of approached work and approached telling a story that to me always seemed very, very authentic. Um, and I don't think I was there yet, but I think that you have informed me as an artist as I've sort of matured. I, I would say that like, you know, something like the Plain Janes that I wrote is very much sort of me trying to channel a little bit of Andrea, um, you know, sort of uh, alternative um, uh, storytelling art piece, like art, art, art stuff. So I do think that even you going on that tangent about like authenticity and you know, questioning story. This is why, this is why I love you because you are quiet and wise and because you're having these deep thoughts about, about story. And I appreciate that about you. Well, it's sort of interesting because I came from this more um, experimental sort of like nonlinear background. I'm kind of often come from the opposite direction where I'm like trying to in a way, get back to the narrative, like, but what's holding all these ideas together, you know, but yeah. what's, you know, but how are you communicating this emotion? Like, how are we getting this all together? Um, I think it's made for some really interesting discussions with us, because I think we both come from story from a different spot, um, but we're able to sort of like, um, talk to each other about it. And then I think it's sort of, you know, it's sort of, it reigns you in and it explodes me out in some way, if that makes mm -hmm. any sense in some of our conversations. I'm not sure about this tea. You know what? That's what the orphan you know, tea box is for. It's adventure. It actually tastes like the, like, like the throat coat tea. Hmm. It's a little licorice -y. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's mm, um, okay. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, I mean, I've loved so many different things that you've done and, you know, and obviously, you know, you should talk about your books, but this is, this is, I'm not just talking to writers during, you know, in, in my tea with Cecil. Um, so, um, but one thing that I really want to talk about, just because I loved it so much and it moved me so much, and it goes back to that authenticity thing that you're talking about. Um, is the piece that you just did uh, at the Chocolate Factory um, over the pandemic, um, which I think is pure genius. Um, and it, I'm gonna get the title wrong. It's not, the end is not what I thought it was. Is that what it is? The end is not what I thought it would be. The end is not what I thought it would be. I had a very lucky chance to watch a rough cut of the film that you made of this performance. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this project and how it came about and just talk about it? Well, in 2020, in the fall of 2020, I was scheduled to have um, a, a run of performances at the Chocolate Factory Theater in New York. And um, it was a commissioned work. Um, and so then, then, then 2020 happened. Um, and somewhere around, I guess, May, um, I emailed Brian Rogers, who's the director of the Chocolate Factory Theater. And I said, so 
this is canceled, right? It's just the fall is canceled. I mean, in New York, the theaters weren't even allowed to open in the fall of 2020. Um, and he was like, yes, it is. But, and by that point he was so exhausted and devastated from having to cancel and postpone everything. He said, if there is any way that your project could exist given the certain parameters of that, of that time, I would be happy to discuss trying to make that happen. And I said, okay. And I thought about it for a couple of weeks. And then I came back and I said, what if I moved into the theater and I lived there for two weeks? And I said, the only person I feel like I can collaborate with is my partner, Bobby. And so he'll, he'll move in with me and conveniently, he's a, a composer and musician. Um, and we're, we're gonna live there and we're, we're gonna make a piece and we're gonna film it. And the end product will be a film, but also sort of living there is also, uh, is also the piece. So that's what happened. We lived there for two weeks at the beginning of December, 2020. And if you don't know the Chalk Factory Theater, you should, first of all, you should, because it's a fantastic place. This was actually um, in their old building. They just moved to a new building. Um, and it's not a theater like you think of a theater, like a traditional um, proscenium theater with a stage. It's like an industrial, uh, it was an old industrial building that had been turned into an, to an art space. So it's very rough, um, you know, the, and there was, there was no shower and there wasn't really a kitchen. There were like too many fridges and like we brought our own toaster oven. So we, so we arrived there with like a cooler full of frozen food and like Trader Joe's meals and our toaster oven and a blow up bed and a, um, uh, an inflatable kiddie pool with a camping shower to shower. And we lived there for two weeks and it was, abs it was, it was, it was absolutely an amazing experience at that, at, at that time. And at that time, it's so weird how like the pandemic has gone through all of these phases because at that time, so that was like nine months into the pandemic. And at that time I realized that since I was 14 years old, that that was the longest time I had not been in a theater either mm -hmm. as an artist or as an audience member going to see something. Longest stretch. Um, Cause I, you know, I don't make performances all that often but I, you know, I go to the theater, you know, or see dance, see theater, see concerts like all the time. And, and it, was, it was really kind of an emotional experience. So we made this film which consisted of um, these nightly performances. Every night we performed on stage to no one. There was no audience. And of course, this wasn't the piece that I, I thought I was going to make. Um, so it was centered around these improvised semi stand-up monologues that I did every night to no one. So it was completely unscripted. It was just what happened in the moment. Um, and, 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 um, it was really, I, it's, I, I hope everyone gets to see the film. It's currently, I don't know, it'll be at some festivals and some screenings later this year. Um, but it was really kind of a transformative experience that in the end really left, it really left Bobby and I in, in tears. And, um, me too. I cried when I saw your movie. <laughs> I mean, I was, and I think you're, you know, it, it is really true. And I didn't even reflect on that. Like, I don't know that since I was, since I've been a, ch a child, you know, that I haven't gone to um, the theater and also movie theaters, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and I definitely feel this sort of like very huge lack. And I think that there was something so beautiful about the film uh, that you made um, with the performances that you did every night. It was very, very effective, but I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Yeah, but just, just saying that it's like sort of, um, then this past fall 21, there was, um, 
in the before times, we used to, because my partner's a musician, we used to often have musicians um, in our house all the time. Like Bobby would rehearse musicians here and people would hang out and make dinner and blah, blah, blah. But of course that like didn't happen for, you know, a year and a half. Then in the fall, he had um, some friends up for the weekend to do a rehearsal residency here. And I was, I was um, like out doing errands or something when they arrived. And so I got back, um, they were already playing. When I got out of the car and I like heard like live music coming from my house, I was like, I had that little like, like yeah. I was, I was really kind of like struck and I almost started to cry. And I was, yeah. and I was like in 2021, at the end of 2021, I was really like, wow, I didn't really, I didn't think anything like that pandemic wise could, could hit me yeah. so hard again. I kind of felt like that. Oh, I felt like that about music when I did the opera in uh, at Thought Bubble. Um, you know, we did it live in this gallery and just like, you know, having these singers just, I mean, it was like a full body recharge of all of my cells just sort of like change directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so strange. Anyway, I hope people see the film too. I can't wait for it to get into festivals. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. And it's such a slice of a moment in a very particular, um, you know, for, uh, from a very particular performance theater um, point of view, where I think it's about almost the grief between performer and audience, you know, um, like it's a conversation about that grief without sort of ever talking about it. Um, just amazing. Uh, okay, now next question. Uh, what are you working on now? You said, okay, you did, you finished the, that, but you're working on a novel? I'm working on a novel, yes. Mm -hmm. And where are you at? It's called that? The Gleaners. <laughs> it's called The Gleaners. I'm in like the middle of you a You don't major... have to tell us what it's about, but you just like, where are you at? What's going on? I I'm in the middle of like a wall. major rewrite, like a major like reconceptualizing rewrite that's actually um going really well it's about um well I'm sure I think we had this discussion before where it's like sometimes you start a project um with a question and this question is uh what does it mean to want to rescue someone so in a way it's sort of about rescue narratives and what is what is that about that desire to want to rescue someone or that desire to be a hero and but part of that is also about the desire for someone else's narrative like the person you want to rescue like like wanting their story and so then there's a part of it that's like well who gets whose story is it and who gets to control the, the story which has been a lot in um, I feel like there have been a lot of essays and uh, 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 things about that lately like whose story whose story is it um, I don't want to talk about those stories but um, mm -hmm. but yeah but I feel like a lot of people are thinking thinking about that um, uh, how do you figure out what you're going to work on like how do you how do you how do you like how do you decide, okay, this is the actual project that I'm doing? Because I'm sure you're like me where you get 50 million ideas and then it's like, all right, which direction do I go in? Um, I, I mean, you sort of work on it because you have to. I mean, otherwise, why not? We're not making tons of money. I'm not making tons of money. Maybe Me you neither. Are. I hope you are. I'm not. Um, I, think I, hope, you know, I, hope you I think you know I am not. I hope you are too. I hope you will. How about that? And I hope right. I will too. Right. Um, but I think I work on something because I have to. And if I feel like I'm forcing myself to work on something, it's there's something's then something's not working. You yeah, know? I, I always say that, like, you know, because, uh, you know, because I write just stories in different forms. And, um, you know, it's like, I always say that the story sort of tells me what it wants to be. I imagine it's the same thing with you. Like, obviously the gleaning told you that it wanted to be a novel and not a performance piece or whatever other thing you might do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that, it's always very clear from the start what a project is, like if it's a book or if it's a performance project or something, that's always very clear. The other thing is, <clears throat> 
this also doesn't serve me financially, but I um, really like the long form. Like I write novels. I don't really write short stories. Mm -hmm. um, and my performances are like, you know, feature length, shall we say. Right. Um, so, and that's just me. I mean, I love the, the short form that other people make. I just don't seem for whatever reason to be drawn to make it. So because of that, my projects take a long time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but yeah. you've done so many amazing, amazing, amazing projects. Like I'm, I'm just like scrolling through in my brain, like, um, you know, I know this year on Google, they did a, a Google of Claude Cahoon, uh, who I share a birthday with, you know, and you did a fabulous piece about, uh, about Claude Cahoon um, in the past. And, um, and yeah, I, I just, that, was, that piece was 20 years ago. What? That oh, macaroni. I got my cane over there. I don't need to hear that. Um, okay. Uh, what is what? Okay. So we kind of talked about this a little bit, your process, your theory, authenticity, all that. What do you have any best art advice to give or what would you give yourself if, if you were, uh, uh, you know, if you could tell yourself like 20 years ago, like give yourself some advice. Honestly, it's like, just keep, just keep going. I even, I wrote down something the other day in my book that was basically the same thing. Oh, cause I was reading this book. Do you know this book? Last Words from Montmartre by oh. Q Miao Jin. No. It's, you know, it's one of those New York Review of Books, books, New York yeah, Review yeah. books. Yeah. Um, and they were having a sale. So um, <laughs> I bought a, I bought like four books. Um, oh, and in it, she said that someone said to her, work for only in working can everything be forgotten. Mm. Hmm. Which I take to mean like that, that everything that needs to be forgotten is like, you know, you know, your stress, your daily life, your whatever, your pat your history, your past that you're trying to not not forget, but to move through or like mm -hmm. to, you know, get to some other place. I don't know. It would definitely be keep going, like keep going, go on. You know, I mean, I think on. that's a really powerful thing because like I often tell students, um, you know, when like when they ask me, well, how do you know? How do you know? And we've talked about this. How do you know if you're a real artist? And I'm like, try quitting. I quit every day, like every day mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm done. It's over. Like I'm finished. I wrote my last, I had my last idea. And then, you know, and then I somehow just like crawl. And I think it's that for, for me, it's that permission to give up that allows me to keep sort of going. But I think mm -hmm. that that's, a, it, it is really valuable and important, um, advice to just keep making work, you know, like just keep making work. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So did you learn or do or grow or, you know, something during the pandemic that you wouldn't necessarily have learned like in other times? Oh, um. I don't know. Well, I dyed my hair blue. Uh -huh. it's been it looks really good. Pandemic. Yeah. Um, so that's something that you did. That is something that I did during the pandemic. Um, we'll, we'll pause for the drum solo. No, yeah. no, I like it. Um, Soundtrack. Um, <laughs> I can't afford Bobby though. <laughs> oh, I painted my room blue. I did that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I didn't look did I I mean I didn't sign up to like you know learn a language or like um yeah I did not make bread although somebody did give me a starter I did yeah not. Bobby made bread Bobby was like did the pandemic like baking thing which I had to like kind of stop because of the pandemic expansion thing that happens <laughs> after the baking thing that was um, another way that you grew yeah, but it, um, um, I don't know. I think, I think now that I don't, whatever phase we're in, I was like, is it ending? Is it not? Is it yeah, just who like, knows? I don't know. But like, there's, 
the opportunity to sort of go inward more like to think more about like your internal life and like the things that the that can be done in the pandemic like reading like writing like watching films and like um listening to drum solos next door um but that's something that happened before the pandemic so it's more like trying to it's like a pandemic long lesson of trying to embrace those things while you know still allowing yourself to mourn the mm -hmm. the things yeah. that you are you are missing yeah yeah um yeah I mean, you know, I would love to go to a bar, Ugh. go dancing, you know, a bunch I, of like, like have sweaty so people. many wishes. Yeah. So many wishes like that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, like, I'd like to see you. I would like to yeah. come see you. I would like to come and hang out with you. And when I do, I think I'm just going to like just hug you for like 50 minutes straight. And, uh, you know, and uh, it's going to be uncomfortably long. Um, Okay, so what is the one thing that you have created uh, that you've done that you wish had gotten a little bit more love? And can you talk about it? Oh my God, everything. Like, <laughs> I'm terribly unsatisfied. Like, I'm, 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 um, I'm, oh, I would, I would say everything. <laughs> that's terrible to say <laughs> do you like, want to bring out my books right I get it's, I get it because because books. you know I kind of feel that way too yeah why don't you talk about one of your books pick one and talk about it it's so weird to like think about your books because um this is my second novel Eden it yes, has two Eden. different covers mm -hmm. um and because I'm it was like so that came out in tw in 2018 and it just feels give us like the blurb. give us the blurb oh the blurb the blurb oh eden i'm like what was it even about it was so long ago you know <laughs> um no eden is about um it's a it's a novel about the um reverberating effects of a childhood trauma it's about two sisters who survived this traumatic childhood event and then they don't really know each other as an adult as adults because one has left and then the younger one whose name is hope uh, decides to go and find her sister, whose name is Eden. Um, and it's sort of about, it's sort of about what, what is it that defines you? Like, what is it, what happens in your life that defines you? You know, what are the things that define us? Do they have to define us? And sometimes they don't. And how, how does one move on and yet right. still acknowledge that something is a part of you? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was a finalist for the Publishing Triangle Award. Um, and you know, all writers are like, there's always mm -hmm. someone who gets a little bit more something, something than you. And I don't know, that's true. just the way- That is true. That's just the way it goes. And you know, I would probably, there are people who think like I've gotten quite a lot. I had- um, Well, but that's the thing, right? That's the thing about making art is that is that it's so, like, I feel like every single time I get something that I was hoping for, it's like the goalpost moves, right? So I it's know. like, you know, and so it's very, it's very, very frustrating. I mean, I, you know, I'll say that there are uh, some books of mine that have fallen out of print that I adore and that like, I wish, you know, people like, you know, I think as a writer, you want people to encounter your story. So like, you know, some, sometimes people will say to me like, oh, I, Oh, I'm sorry I didn't buy it. I got it in the library. I'm like, good. Did you read it? Like, just mm -hmm. read the thing, you know? Um, but it it is very frustrating because there's all these like, there's all these like machinations behind, you know, uh, like it's just sort of luck and timing and you know, marketing and like all these things that are so beyond our control. And I think that's why going back to what you were talking about, you know, um doing the work, that's the only thing that that we really can have any any control over yeah you can control whether you write another book or not right or whether you make another film or album or whatever or not like that's in your control you can't control 
you know, whether it gets reviewed in the New York Times, exactly. whether it gets reviewed favorably in the New York Times, or whether it gets translated or whether it gets translated or whatever, whatever, or you know, yeah. the right people talk about it. You know, yeah. that's all completely yeah. out of your control. It was weird. We so we did um right before Omicron, we did um like a, a friends and family screening of the of the movie. And it. we went out afterwards. Um and uh, a friend of mine who's also a um, choreographer performance artist um, was having like, she was like having a moment where she like, she felt really like under, underappreciated. And she was like, uh, was saying to another friend of ours, like, um, or, uh, they, were having, they were like, well, ask Andrea, ask Andrea. And then she was like, Andrea, have you ever gotten one of those super secret grants or res that you have to be nominated for, like it's a super secret process. Have you ever gotten that? And I was like, no. And she, well, have you ever been on one of those super secret panels for the super secret grants that you have to be nominated for? And I was like, I've never been on a super secret panel for a super secret grant, nor have I received a super secret nomination to a or fellowship or something. I yeah. haven't that those I haven't. I've gotten lots of other things, but but never that. And she said, but would you tell me? if you had been on the super secret panel to the super secret grant. And I was like, actually I would, they would probably make me sign a non-disclosure agreement. I mean, I wouldn't tell you if I was on the current year's panel cause that right. would be, you know, you know, not allowed, whatever. Um, but she was like, she was like really like obs obsessed with this. And I was sort of like, that's That is completely out of your control. That's like, you know, that sort of like Totally. But there's, there's like, you know. there's some like, you know, there's like that residency in a castle, you know, that like you can only go to if like, you know, some princess likes, you know, has heard of you and invites you. I mean, I want that. I want to go to a castle. And it's all, talk. all that stuff is out of your control or like someone, you know, and then for some of the super secret nomination things, then you hear like trickle down, you know, gossip or blah, blah, blah. You'll hear like, <clears throat> well, they wanted, you know, people under 40 or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever they wanted people yeah, not yeah. in New York, yeah, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that, you know, you know, that's just that you have to, you know, you may, I, you know, you would be shocked to learn who, like I know artists who are, you know, I consider famous. Um, who are, you know, very well established or whatever, but who have like never gotten the Guggenheim or something right, or right. never this. And you're like, what? Really? What? You know, what? No, I know. And it's like, yeah. And a lot of times, like, you know, like you'll read, like, you know, I don't know, like a New York Times thing about someone and that, you know, that you think is super cool. And you're like, and you recognize so much of like your own sort of it's not the same career path, obviously, but like these sort of like career milestones or like these uh, sadnesses or whatever. And you're like, oh, wow, they like, like, wow, that person had that kind of problems too. Like that's so intense. Um, but the other thing I, that I always remember, I try to remind myself about is that, and I guess it's different with sort of live performance, you know, like with the operas that I've done, um, and stuff, even if they might live on in sort of like a recorded fashion, um, that, you know, the books, you know, book of an album, a film, those last forever. They can, uh, they're always there for people to stumble upon and, um, and, uh, and discover and find, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, we're getting towards Next question. my 10 questions. Uh, what are you obsessing about? It can be anything. It doesn't have to be art. It can be anything. Um, I'm, I'm, well, in, in one sense, I'm sort of obsessing about obsession. Like, um, I've been, um, like looking for books about obsessive love. And then I've also been interested in, um, um, like carnality in literature, like hmm. literature with a lot of graphic sex. Hmm. Um, Fascinating. And, um, That's yeah. going to bruise something up for you. Can't yeah. wait. Um, and um, I feel like I wrote this down. Oh, and then another thing that I'm interested in is also um, 
uh, nature, nature writing, like people who have written on nature and then in the natural world. And those all sort of like have to, those all have to do with the novel that I'm writing. Um, I should send present. you, I don't know if it's uh, helpful at all, but I just found this, um, uh, this like, it's like a bird and artist residency, like about birds. I'll send you the link. Maybe, maybe it yeah. will be of interest to you. Birds is like, I know it's I not I'm more, I guess I'm more interested in like plants because no birds, I know I know that's like a whole scene the birds. it, is, so it is a whole it's a whole it's a whole thing but I is it did you lose your earring or your no my earbud you know oh. I got these new earbuds I used to wear like the donut you know yeah yeah earbuds. yeah and now I've like you know at Christmas yeah. I got these things but I don't know I guess I guess I'm discovering I have very small ear canals or something <laughs> because they keep like like just like 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 popping out and flying across the room. So um, okay, know. well, that kind of dovetails into my uh, my last question, which is just like, what are you working on now? Or, um, but maybe we can adjust the question and say, um, what what is your what is your what is the thing beyond your novel that you are looking forward to working on? Is there like, do you have like, like, oh, I'd like to 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 do another performance piece or is uh, like I'd like to write a film like what's your like is there any sort of like little sparky thing that you, and you don't need to tell me what it's about but like is there any kind of like well my next my project down the line are you already well, that? well I don't know if you've ever had this experience but I always sort of feel like I'm on a good track with my current writing project if I know what the next the idea for the next book is yeah like if I if I know what the idea for the next book is then I feel like maybe I'm maybe I'm close to the end of this book you know because I'm already thinking about that so I do have an idea for a novel after I finish this one and then I had um such an interesting time making this movie that um I was sort of interested in making another one but it's you know that would be so or I'm, I guess I'm really, I'm interested in what a performance for film is. Not, um, I should clarify that the movie I made, it was not like just a document of, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't just a concert film. It was more like, um, uh, if you know the work of Spalding Gray, Swimming mm -hmm. to Cambodia, Monster yeah, in a Box. Of course. So it, it's sort of in the tradition of the great New York monologuist, you know. <laughs> Who am I? Of course. I don't know. Spot and Gray. You're talking Bernard. about the people yeah. out there who might not yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about the people out there who might not know. Um, and I, in preparation for that project, I was like, I was sort of like, I've got to figure out how to make a movie. I've got to learn a lot about film, like right now, like a month before. And like, I watched, um, all of these, I talk about this in the movie. I watched all of these Chantal Ackerman films that were oh, on the yeah, Criterion you did talk Channel. About yeah, 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 because yeah. they had like, you know, the Criterion Channel makes these little yeah. like, that's yeah. how they organize them in these little collections. Um, and it's really, this is, I think something um, like when I talk about, I'm obsessed with obsession, like, like kind of this is what I'm it's this it's been a struggle in the pandemic because you would think the pandemic is like now I'm going to sit down and I'm going to like watch all the Chantal Ackerman films on the Criterion channel but I think because we've all like been through this trauma and that the the way that we've you know sought to keep our connection going is through the internet which seeks to divert your attention everywhere that it's hard to really focus and say I'm just going to watch like sort of like your Disney project like mm -hmm. I'm going to watch I'm going to watch all the Disney movies in sequential order, you know? Um, so, but if you can do that, if you can like limit your focus to like one thing, you mm -hmm. learn so much more, you learn quite a lot. So yeah, it was, it was weird. I'm also like, I've also recently had this idea, like I've had, um, so I wasn't, I talk about this in the film, I wasn't able to complete my Chantal Ackerman, like watch every Chantal Ackerman experience because the Criterion channel, like is so sneaky oh, and right. they start like when the month changes, they're like, maybe we'll just take a few away. We're taking yeah. a few away. And I'm like, God damn it. Um, so now I have to like pay to watch them elsewhere. Like on, I don't know, I'll have to get a movie account or something. But also before that, I was reading all of um, Derek Jarman's books, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. the filmmaker Derek Jarman. He's an incredible, incredible writer. 
um, about film and about life, like in that time in the in the in the AIDS, AIDS epidemic yeah. of um, the eighties and early nineties yeah. in the UK. Um, and I have one Derek Jarman book left to read. Weirdly, I didn't go in sequential order. I went out of order because I started with Modern Nature. So I was interested in nature writing, um, which is a fantastic book. Um, so I think I read Modern Nature through the end. And then I have his first book, Dancing Ledge Left to Read. And I had this, I was going to read that book and then watch his last film, which is Blue. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. So yeah, so I try to like have these like weird little they're not art projects. They're like intake projects. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think, consumption yeah, projects. I mean, I think for me, I, I mean, I think for me, that's part of the creative process too, right. Is like, sort of like, you know, uh, you know, obsessing about sort of this one, like, sometimes it's like, I want to watch, it's not this, but like, I, I might be like, okay, for some reason, I need to watch every single version of every single Robin Hood film. <laughs> and then I just watch it. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's going to teach me. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's very bad, um, you know, and, and I'm angry at myself. But there's like some sort of like thing inside of me that I need to work out by sort of watching or reading like, you know, something that's very focused like that. So I get it mm -hmm. because I feel like it is part of the part of the art process and part of the art spark um I mean don't get me wrong I feel like I'm coming across as like a weirdy weird snooty like super art person but I also watch the great British bake-off you know yeah no Andrea yeah and you okay. know what it's okay if you're a weird arty person I'm very arty as well you know um but then I also you know I'm playing a zombie killing game right now so you know yeah. we're multi we can do while you're talking to me yeah yeah um Okay, well, Andrea, thank you so much for being my guest on Tea with Cecil. I'm sorry that your tea was not. My tea sucked. Yeah, I'm sorry while. that your tea sucked. But your tea with me was fabulous. Um, uh, you can find Andrea uh, at www.andreaklein.com. And then where, can, well, where else can we find you on social media? Oh, I'm also, well, I'm also on Twitter at uh, Andrea Klein and Instagram, Andrea, Andrea Klein, because I think a teenager with the same name took it before I did. Um, and my name has a Klein with weird spelling. It's K-L-E-I-N-E. -E. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and I don't know how to end these things. So we will just say goodbye. I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh -huh.